Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to be taking a look at the Project Logical Editor. Now this is a Cubase Pro feature only, so I've already uh, got rid of half of the audience. Uh, and it's a really, really useful feature, but it's something that uh, I'm not sure many people know about or use. Now, this is different to the logical editor, even though it looks very similar. So if you haven't seen the logical editor, the logical editor is a programmatic way of changing MIDI parts. It's really super useful. And if you can work out what you need to do with it, it can save you potentially hours of tedious editing. Uh, there's a series of videos on it I've linked them in the description, so take a look at those if you're not sure what the logical editor is. But if you are, the project logical editor takes this and moves this to a more Cubase-centric view. So although it can do some MIDI features, it's a bit like using a screwdriver as a hammer in some cases. It's not the tool for the job, even though you might be able to get the job done with it, but it definitely doesn't give you everything that the logical editor does. But it does do a whole load of things, which again, it can automate tedious tasks. And there's often times when, you know, you're late in a session or whatever, and you're a bit tired, and it's easy to miss things. And for tasks like that, it can make sure you don't screw up, which is always nice. So with no further ado, let's get into it and take a look at some of the presets. So here we have a project in Cubase and as you can see, the project logical editor lives uh, understandably under the project menu. So there's two ways to access it. The first one is the scary way. So you go to project logical editor and then you're confronted with the interface, which is very much like the logical editor. It's a bit old school, possibly needs a bit of love and updating. Or you can use the preset. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And then in a future video, we'll look at how to create your own uh, logical editor settings which will allow you to do the jobs that you want to do so fine tuning these presets and probably creating some from scratch as well so first things first let's look at some of these presets and go through an example of why this might put people off so first one the first one on the examples here is colorize small midi parts which colorizes any midi part which is below a bar long so if you've got a slightly sloppy editing style and you end up with loads of detritus all over the place this might be useful for you to highlight them so here you can see i've got some smaller, less than a bar long parts, and it's highlighted all of them, which is uh, fairly useful depending on um, how much mess you make. Now, the next one I think is a reason why people might want, just think that they don't know what they're doing. So the next one says delete volume automation. So as you can see here, I've created some volume automation on these parts here. And if I go to apply the preset, you think, well, that's gonna disappear and and it doesn't it doesn't do it so in a future video we'll look at what is happening with that because i don't want to get too into that but that's something i think people will probably open up go oh that doesn't work i'm doing it wrong i'm going to give up with this which is often the case with tools like this so don't try and use that one because it will not do you any favors however um some of them are useful and actually work which is nice so the next one is select MIDI parts named drum. So we'll look at how to modify this later on, but this will just select any MIDI parts, which I've called drum. So you see here, I've got these ones which have got drum in them for whatever reason, they're across multiple tracks, but that can be useful. So again, we'll look at how to extend that kind of thing uh, in a future video. So then I could do whatever, I can delete those, etc., as normal, that kind of thing. Next one is down in the naming section so under naming we've got rename and renumber audio tracks so what often happens with me is i i get projects where people have just maybe duplicated tracks so possibly some people you know they get one audio track and because they don't want to create it from scratch and map it out and so on what they'll do is just duplicate a track uh like this and then you end up with audio 1d and then we end up with all these tracks which have all got the same name or whatever this can be pretty useful for working so you can make reference to things and actually not go right it's audio one uh d of d or whatever and so on and copy of this and so on so this is useful just for tidying things up so again under naming rename and renumber audio tracks and there we go so now they're actually named in a sane manner audio one two three four five again you can modify that 
uh, with skills we'll we'll look at in the next video in the series. But that can be really useful. I I use that fairly regularly, say particularly on projects which I get from clients where it's maybe a mess when it comes to me. Let's leave it at that. Uh, talking of messes, one of my um, techniques for for working is I end up with a junkyard of parts towards the end or after the end of a project. So typically there will be a graveyard of poor ideas, which is after the end of the project. So what's really useful with this? Yeah, you can highlight them, but if you've got a project which has got 50 odd tracks or whatever, and the folders are in different states, the easiest thing to do is use this, which I'm just going to set my cursor to there because after bar 13, I don't want anything. Go to project and then under parts and events, we've got to delete events beyond song cursor and they're all gone. And notice that automation goes, everything goes from that point and that's fine. So there we go. We're done. On a similar tip, we've got delete automation beyond cursor. So again, sometimes you end up with all sorts of automation that you don't want. And maybe there's a point in the song where you think, from this point onwards, I need to do my automation again because things have changed, possibly because you put your automation in maybe a bit early in the workflow, etc. So let's just put it halfway through bar seven. And again, under here, under parts and events, delete all automation beyond cursor. And it's gone. And now we've got a clean automation slate to start with from this point onwards. Again, that can be really useful, particularly if your name is Fraser. Next one, parts and events, select if color one. Now, one of the things that I do when I'm editing a part, a project, et cetera, is I will use color to mark out which parts need my attention. So maybe I'm scanning through a track and I, I will just highlight the things which need to be worked on and then I will be able to work on them later on. And, you know, sometimes for whatever reason, I may break from something. And when you come back, you've probably forgotten about it if you haven't marked it in some way. So I tend to use, I actually tend to use the color red because it, it highlights it really clearly. I've, I've never been a huge fan of the spectrum of colors which Steinberg chooses. Uh, I'm red, green, colorblind slightly. Uh, I don't know if that's anything to do with it, but I don't find these particularly distinct. I think there would be much nicer, friendlier, easier to define distinct color, you know, uh, things which would be much clearer for, for people to see because these, to me, these aren't hugely distinct, but I'm sure there'll be loads of comments going, what, are you crazy? I've had that all my life. Yes, I can see things of a color. I've not got x-ray vision and no, I'm not a dog. But anyway, uh, this can be quite useful because you can just highlight these parts. Again, go to Project Logical Editor, uh, parts and events, and then select parts using color one. And there you can see those are ready to go. This also means that maybe if you use that kind of color coding for parts that you want to remove or mute from a certain mix, etc., you can do that kind of thing. So in this case, because they're now selected, if we want to mute that, I've muted both those parts simultaneously by changing them in the info line, and then I can unmute them or I could transpose them or do whatever editing I want to do to them. So this gives you access to that. Now, obviously, this is a pretty simple project, but if you'd applied that across a project with uh, 100 tracks and that was 10 minutes long, it would allow you to just quickly, right, I can just highlight all those parts. I can change them. I can transpose them or whatever I need to do to them. And that can work really, really well. Make life really, really easy for you, which is the whole point of this. Now, another thing which I often do during the course of a project is I may well mute tracks once they are finished with. So maybe they're the older versions of something which I've left in there for a client to decide whether they want, you know, version one or version two without them having to go through using track versions, which some people find a bit intimidating. But for whatever reason, you can end up with them being muted. Now, the problem with doing that is if you hit this button here, and deactivate or mute states, you've lost that, and then you're in trouble. So I tend to mute the parts on the track as well. But once I'm sure I don't want it anymore, again, I would normally delete them, I might move them to a parts graveyard folder, but generally, they would end up uh, dying at some point and just being removed. Again, you can do it manually, obviously, but why do it manually? 
when you can just go to tracks and delete muted tracks. And there you go. They've gone and they're not coming back. So this, again, there's there's a number of them in here which are really useful. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to just take a look at these because I, I don't want to make a 45-minute long video going through all of these. I think just having a look and seeing some of these and finding ones which work for you. So even if you only find one or two which do the kind of things that you want that normally would be a tedious task, then it's been worth doing. So there you go, a quick look at the Project Logical Editor. Now, one of the reasons why I put in the volume automation preset not working is because I think it's important to try and build confidence in these kind of things. There'd be a lot of people who just wouldn't even look at this feature, or if they did, they might open up the logical editor, sorry, PLE, and find it intimidating and just go, oh, you know, that's not for me. Uh, and if you get a preset that doesn't work, you think, ah, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I should go, uh, you know, give up and go and play the bazooki or something else like that. And that's not what you want. So if it doesn't work, don't worry too much about it, but try one of the other presets. So go through them. There may be others that don't do exactly as they're advertised, uh, I've not found that, but that doesn't mean to say they're not in there because I don't think I've been through every preset. I've looked at the names of all of them, but I don't think I've used all of them. Uh, the, the important thing to remember with this is that even if you just use one part of it and it saves you a few minutes every time you do it, or it means you do it accurately rather than missing things, which is you know often the case with, with humans, uh, that it's been worth learning. So it doesn't matter if you only use you know, one of those presets. So if you only use delete beyond cursor and you don't do anything else, because it will do it accurately, you can assign it to a keyboard shortcut and then you'll be in business, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the, the key with this is spending a bit of time with it, maybe finding something in there. There may be something in the menus where you go, oh, that's the one for me. I've, I've always wanted to delete notes which are over 480 pulses per quarter note or whatever you know that kind of thing but if you find just that one thing then that will be good enough and that would have been worthwhile in the next video what we're going to look at is customizing those presets to to fine tune them so you can change some of the settings in there and then in a third video we're going to look at making them from scratch so it's just a bit of a progression in using it but it can be really useful, say, particularly if you're doing repetitive tasks. So I've got a one, one thing which I do quite a lot at the moment, and the Project Logical Editor helps me with that, and it just saves a bit of time, but it means you know I'm done five minutes earlier on every session. As ever, I hope you found this video useful, and if you have, please like, subscribe, yada, 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 all the algorithm manipulation that you can do. But anyway, hopefully we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition. <laughs>